Um, that's right, we're going to be talking about WSGI. I'm going to say WSGI because it's a hell of a lot easier than saying WSGI 500 times in this talk. Uh, so we're going to talk about WSGI. You're all web developers, or presumably some of you are web developers. If you're not, that's OK. This only sort of assumes a basic understanding of Python to get through some of the code that we'll be looking at. So yeah, my name's Ryan. Um, I'm R. Wilson Perkin on Twitter. I don't do much on there. And yeah, I'm a software developer at Wave where I lead our developer systems and tools team, which means that I'm spending a lot of my time focused on internal customers. I build things for developers. But when I started, I was doing a lot of stuff for Wave's customers. So I was building products. I was working on our invoicing. I worked on our API for a little while. And that had me doing a lot of web development and a lot of handling across different types of web development. And this was great. I got to learn Django. I got to learn a lot of things right out of school. Uh, but in about 2016, I ended up feeling kind of lost because I'd built up this great understanding of web development. And I felt very secure in it until all of a sudden I was responsible for a service that had no framework. And this was a foreign concept to me. Django is a very opinionated framework that does a lot. And when you don't have it, when you are suddenly faced with the idea that you have no framework to depend on, no docs to read, it's a confusing place to be. It's not to say that this had completely no framework. It's just that it was custom built, poorly documented, very small. I'm sure you've run across something like that before. So this is what I was used to. I was very familiar with the concept of like Nginx Geunicorn and Django. This was in all the Medium articles at the time. It was already set up for me when I got there. And to be honest, I didn't really understand the left side of this. I got really good at Django, but I didn't know all that much about what Nginx or Geunicorn were doing. Nginx had something to do with HTTP. It was called a reverse something or other. And Geunicorn was doing something in the middle there, but I couldn't have told you what. So I doubled down, and I just learned Django really well. And it's great, because coming out of school and starting web development, Django does a lot for you right out of the box. In fact, you get routing and views and middleware and templates and many other things provided for you, well documented. And if you understand those things, you can get your work done. What I liked the most is that it had this very simple request response format. I would get a request, and I would give back a response. And that basically became my job. If I could do those two things really well, then I could get my work done. And I could do all of the business logic inside that context. But at a certain point, you start thinking about, how did I get HTTP into this Python view that I'm dealing with? Right? HTTP looks something like this. It's this textual format. But I'm dealing with this fully hydrated like Python request object. It has methods on it. There's a bunch of data inside it. How did I get to this point? So when I laid it all out, there's Nginx, there's Geunicorn, Django, and Python. That stuff over there on the right, that's my code. And that's doing what I know very well. So I know that there's HTTP coming into this system. And I know that I route to my code through Django, because I set those URL routes up. But this other shit, I had no idea. Um, Something was happening there. Maybe it was sockets. Maybe there was something happening at the file system level. Maybe it was imports, but I wasn't sure, which really bit me when I suddenly had no framework, because I couldn't depend on that URL routing anymore. And I had to learn how those other tools worked. So what I did, and what I recommend you do, is to look for something familiar, to go through that code base and try and find something that you can pattern match to the area that you're familiar with. And thankfully, Somebody had the decency to name this whiskey.py. So I came across something that looked a hell of a lot like what I was used to in Django. I didn't understand the other concepts in here. We were importing something called a registry and an RPC from this service. Maybe you're guessing at what this does already. Um, and then we were initializing things. And what I really zoomed in on was there was this application function that took a couple arguments. And that looked like something that I'd seen before in Django. Because Django had this very similar pattern also in a whiskey.py file. If you start a new project in Django and you use the default template builder or something like cookie cutter, you'll end up with a whiskey.py file like this. So I knew that I was going to have to explore the rest of this code a little bit better. And I had this really great suggestion made to me to follow the request. The idea is that if you only know how that request works, if you get the URL right into your view and you have a request, follow it back down that stack and figure out what else is going on. So a really easy way to do this is a pattern like this. I can set up a URL route to that view, and I can just raise an exception in there. Because I know that when I hit that view, I'm going to generate a big fat stack trace like this. In fact, if I'm running Django in debug mode, that's even going to show up in the browser for me, which is super convenient. And if not, then it shows up in my terminal. 
But down there at the bottom is the exception that I raised. And up at the top, we see that whiskey.py file again. So now I know that that is the furthest point back up in my stack trace. That's where I'm coming in from. So it's great. I know that I can focus on this whiskey.py file. I'm feeling validated that I thought this was an important file. But I'm kind of stuck now. Because how did this become the entry point? Is application kind of like a main function in C or some other thing that gets invoked automatically? I don't know that part. So simple approach is grep for what you know, right? Search through the rest of the code base and see where else you can find whiskey referenced. And here, I find this run script that we have, which is invoking gunicorn. It's you know, setting some flags on it. But it's pointing at that module, that myjango.wisgy module. And this is really nice because it's starting to fill in some of those blanks. I don't know exactly what's happening, but I know that this interface here has something to do with Whiskey. Unfortunately, I'm also out of ways to search my code base. Right? That was the last thing that I found that was referencing Whiskey, and I'm kind of stuck. So it's time to take that search to the internet, where when I search Whiskey, I come across PEP333, which was published in 2003. Seven years later, a new version, PEP3333, would come out because it added Python 3 support, and these jokers think they're clever. <laughs> and it defined a document that explained the web server gateway interface, which is this acronym we've been talking about the whole time. The web server gateway interface was meant to support portability so that web servers and web applications could communicate across a common interface, which meant that you weren't tied to something like Apache or Nginx anymore. You could freely switch between tools because anything that understood this common interface could talk to any application framework. And any application framework authors, like some of you in the audience that might want to start something like this, it made it very easy for you to get started. You didn't have to know everything about HTTP. You could just build something that implemented this, a central function, or any callable, really. Um, by convention, it's called application, and it takes two arguments, a start response callback that will be invoked with the status code and the headers that you want to send back. And then you return an iterable of data. And that data is what's going to get sent back out to your users. So in this case, we're simply responding with hello world. And that's going to get iterated over by our web server and sent back. It also gets this environ object, which is a really basic dictionary containing some information. This was also a revelatory experience for me because that's HTTP, right? Like That's some of the parts of it that are embedded inside this dictionary. So I'm starting to get a better sense of how that fits into the picture. But this dictionary does look kind of weird. And it has me wondering why I'm not just dealing with a request object, because that's what I'm most familiar with. So it's important that we look at the historical context this came up in. You see, early, we had static web servers. They're really fast, and they serve boring files. You could have a bunch of HTML files that you stored on your hard drive. And when a request came in, it would get routed to pick that file off your hard disk and send it back to the user. It was great because this is really fast. We could cache it very well. We could do some great tricks in memory. And it made it really easy to serve static content. But it was static, which meant that things like sessions, things like um, dynamic views, or some of the things that we rely on in web frameworks today weren't really possible in this world. When you wanted to change something, you had to go and edit that HTML file. Born of that was this idea of the common gateway interface, which shares at least one part of its name with Whiskey. And this was the idea that instead of serving a file, you would instead invoke a script. So now you had a separate web server and scripts. And this is probably familiar to you if you've done much Perl or PHP development. It's not as popular in the Python community, but it is possible. And here, the idea is that your scripts would still reside on the hard drive. And when a request came in for that script, instead of serving the contents of it, you would actually invoke the script. And what I love about this is some of the simplicity, the sort of like Unixiness of this, is that you would set some environment variables as input. So your HTTP request that you got, it just breaks down into a bunch of environment variables. You set those. You execute the script. They serve as inputs. So we're kind of treating a whole script as a kind of function that we're invoking. And the other nice simplistic simplicity of this is that you can just use standard out as output. So rather than needing to return anything, making a blob, sort of uh, writing anything to disk, you're just printing stuff out. You can print hello world, and it will result in an HTTP response for you. I love this pattern. I think it's really cool. But it had a limitation, 
and it's that you were forced to restart this on every request. What I mean by that is that when a request comes in, you're forced to invoke the entire script. For something like Python, that means starting the whole interpreter up, and even if that adds a few hundred milliseconds, that's a few hundred milliseconds that you're pushing off on every request, and that really slows us down. What we're really looking for is we want a combination of these things. We want something that's fast, we want it to be dynamic, we want it to be Pythonic, preferably, because that's the realm that we're working in. And what we're looking for is this idea of a separate web server and a separate Python application that we can pass requests into when we get them, and we can get responses back out to send to the user. That is the purpose that WSGI was seeking to fill, is that we would define this very common or very simple callable that would take these requests as they came, and it would send back the responses. You wouldn't have to keep rebooting the Python server. You would just call the function many times. So now we have this web server and application model. And when we apply that to the stack that I was working in, we're looking at that as GUnicorn and Django. So GUnicorn all this time has been serving as my web server, which I would know if I had spent five seconds reading the docs. <laughs> And Django is that process that's being run, and when requests come in, are just getting passed into it. And at that point, it goes through the whole of the Django framework, through URL routing, through middlewares, through context, into my view. And really, it's maybe more akin to show it looking like this, this big, terrifying Django unicorn, because it's actually sort of driving that Django application. Right? The requests are coming in, it's feeding them internally. But that decoupling, that fact that we have a common interface, means that I can easily swap out Django for Flask. Or I can swap out GUnicorn for something like uWSGI, because they talk a common format. And you might be thinking, well, where's Nginx in this? Nginx is actually sitting in front of this. And the reason I didn't bring it up in the earlier slides is because I realized that it's not a part of the, the WSGI process here as much. See, Nginx is actually a, a fully featured web server in the same way that GUnicorn is, except it has some additional capabilities that we can use. If somebody's uploading a, a very large file to your site, GUnicorn's going to block while it does all of that, but Nginx is really good at offloading that task, buffering that big file, and then quickly handing it off to GUnicorn. So it serves a purpose. It just doesn't serve a purpose inside the WSGI framework that we're talking about, which makes me feel good because I get to fill in this final thing, right? HTTP is coming in. It's also then getting passed to GUnicorn. That's then invoking the function inside Django which is routing things to my code. So we have a pretty good model for this right now. But one thing that I really like to do to cement this understanding in my head is to rebuild things from scratch, to take these things that feel magical and difficult, and to see how easily you can build them out. So we're going to build a Python web server. We're going to accept HTTP. We're going to parse it. We're going to send back HTTP responses. We're going to do all that in about 100 lines of Python code or so. And it means actually dealing with network connections and sockets and so we'll receive HTTP using those sockets. And that terrified me, because as a web developer, I'm handing off that stuff to my framework. And I really don't want to think about that in my day to day. But it turns out Python makes this really easy for us, too. So we can open a socket and then bind to my local host on port 8000. And we can listen for new connections. So now connections can come in on that port. And then we can accept them when they do. Once we have that, if we zoom in on this latter half, we can just enter into a very basic loop where we accept new connections, we receive a kilobyte of data from them, we're going to naively assume that it's UTF-8 and just decode that, and then print them out to our terminal. And then we'll send back hello world. It's not a valid HTTP response. If you hit this with your browser, it would be confused, and Chrome will give you a weird error message. But it's enough for us to start. So it looks like that, and it prints out that. So I hit this with curl, and it tells me what the request was that just came in. It's like a really basic sort of echo server. And that HTTP that we're looking at, it breaks down into a couple pieces. There's the method, which you're likely familiar with. These are things like get or post or options. There's the path, which is the URL that was asked for, and the spec. That's important more so these days because we now have HTTP2. And I'm doing a basic example here with 1.1. You also have a bunch of headers. And in here, we have no body. Right? I wasn't posting data or sending anything up, so it's a very simple request. And it's not really a web server until we parse that, because so far, all we're doing is accepting text. Somebody could have sent anything. If we want it to be an HTTP server, we need to parse that and do something with it. So how about some basic HTTP parsing? 
We'll accept that HTTP, which is a big string. We're going to split it up into some lines. The first one is called the request line, then a whole bunch of headers lines, an empty line, which we'll discard with this little underscore variable, and then the body. And that request line, it further breaks down into the method, the path, and the protocol. The headers, they get split up. So we iterate over those lines, and each one gets split into a key and a value based on the colon separator. And we'll just return all those. So we are returning a tuple from this function that takes a string, and we've parsed some HTTP. Naively, yes, but we've parsed some HTTP. And we need to respond with it, too. We need to make it something that a browser can understand. We need to be able to turn this into a full server. And an HTTP response looks a little like this. It's pretty similar. We have a protocol again, same one. We have a status code, which we're saying is 200. We got some headers, and this time we have a body, because a response typically wants to send something back. To do that, let's say we give it a response object. Again, a string, and here, we're going to embed that inside a valid HTTP response to make this a real format. So we send back 200 OK, because our web server is simple and thinks that everything is always fine. We dynamically compute the content length by seeing how long that response was. We say that it's text and HTML. And then we send back a new line and our response object, and we finish off with another new line. That's our ability to send back valid HTTP responses. And if we tie those things together, the processing requests, the processing response, maybe a little bit in between, we have a web server. We have one that looks like this. It accepts connections. It receives that kilobyte of data, which it then parses. So we have this request tuple. It passes it into a view. And here, I'll ask that you use your imagination. That view takes a tuple. It's all the parsed HTTP. Anything that you might want to do dynamically, you can probably do based on the content that was passed in there. So imagine a dynamic view that sends back some response, which we'll process. And we'll turn it into an HTTP string. And we'll send that back to the user. We have, in a very small amount of Python, a working HTTP server that we can customize however we want. And I leave it to you to imagine what that view looks like. But it doesn't tie back to the whole point of this talk unless we make it compatible with WSGI. We want this to be portable, right? We want this to take off and everybody to be using it. And for that, we need to convert our request into this Environ dictionary, because we're going to need to call into somebody else's application with it. So we format that. We take the, the method that was given to us, and we put it inside this special key. Same with the path and the server protocol. These are all defined names. And there's this whiskey.input one, which takes, in this case, we're sending a string IO. Really, this just needs to be something that can be read from, like a stream or a file. In this case, we've already uh, brought in the entire body, and it's in memory. So we're going to wrap it in string I.O. so that it can be read from like a file. And again, I'll ask you to use your imagination, because we also need to format the headers. And all this really means is that each of those header keys are going to get prefixed with a capital, capitalized HTTP underscore. And the reason it's not on this slide is because it didn't fit. So we can make an environ dictionary, and we can make a start response callback. The callback uses the closure pattern. If you're familiar with JavaScript, you might have used this. It's used in a bunch of other languages. It's not as predominant in Python. But the idea here is that this function that we've created has access to that same connection object that we want to send data back on. So the first thing that it does is sends back the status code that we got. Then it'll iterate over all the headers that it was called with, and it will send those back as well. And finally, it sends a blank line, because the next thing that will be sent is the body, and we need our separator. So we have a start response callback. And we can put those together into something that's WSGI compatible. It receives a kilobyte of data. It parses it from HTTP. It turns it into an environ dictionary. And it calls the application with it. It passes in the start response callback so that the application can do whatever it wants. And when it gets that response back, we know it's an iterable of data. So we'll iterate over it. And we'll send each of those chunks back to the user. We've made a WSGI compatible web server which means that we can go to the other side. We can play around. We can make an application. This, if you look at the side that we've been talking about, this is where you would keep going if you wanted to get really into web server development. If you wanted to build something to dethrone G-Unicorn or U-Whiskey, you wanted to make some great new features in that space. You're likely a web application developer. You're likely to be on this side, where you're making the application object, and you're building up a framework from it. Right? That application object, 
it's deferring to this dynamic view. This is where I'll show you an example of the dynamic view that I came up with. Right? It takes an environ dictionary, and it just says hello from the URL that it got. And our application calls it in that standard way, which means that if we built this application, we could run it with GUnicorn. We could run it with uWSGI. It would respect those things, and it would send back content, and it would be valid. Which should say that web servers are so easy. Right? Like, why do you need any of these tools? We built it in like five minutes in 100 lines of Python code. And web servers are easy, as long as you don't need Post or cookies or SSL or chunked encoding. There's a lot going on for you that I'm minimizing here in order to show the fact that building these things, even simple versions of these things, is a great way to demystify what's actually going on. I'm not advocating that you take this code and run it in production. If you do, I will not be held liable. You can build versions of this stuff to play with and to understand better. And you can build a web application. I always thought it would be really cool to build a web framework, but I had no idea where to start. And researching this was what made me feel that I could actually do something like that. Now, we've done a lot. We looked at how WSGI fit into the world that I was looking at, which was this, app, this frameworkless application. And we looked at some of the historical context, right? CGI informed the shape of this environ dictionary. It set environment variables, and we ended up with a dictionary called environ. WSGI was meant to be very simple to approach, because if it wasn't, it wouldn't have gained adoption. I don't actually have a slide for it, but you know that XKCD comic where it's like, if you introduce another standard, now you just have another standard, you don't actually like, bring them together all that well? That was what they were concerned about. You don't want to build something that's so different from all the others that it doesn't gain traction. So this was meant to be simple. And we've also been really focused on Django, because that's my preference and that's what I tend to work in day to day. But if you're familiar with other frameworks, this is pretty similar. Pyramid has this application object that comes back from the make whiskey app call. So it's very explicit about what it's doing. And it comes in this main function. If you're familiar with Flask, the application we've been talking about is actually the app that you're used to decorating your views with. It actually supports being called with a start response in an environ, and it will run through the whole loop. So it's got the URL routing and everything built into that object, which I thought was really cool. And in Bottle, it actually has this default app callable. So you can import this and call it, and it'll actually have hooks for things other than WSGI. There were things that predated it, and this sought to support a whole bunch of different protocols. And in fact, this will deal with other types of web servers too. So what I hope you take away from this is that these abstractions help, right? They're very, very useful to us until one day they aren't. Until you realize that you've been depending so much on those abstractions that you're missing out on what's going on underneath. And when those abstractions disappear, it can be really hard to find your footing. I also hope that you'll have some fun with this stuff, right? Like, a lot of us got into development because it's fun. And it's very interesting to learn what's going on underneath these applications and realizing that we can do a lot of this stuff ourselves. Finally, I hope I've shown, I hope I've proved, that Whiskey isn't magic. This is some very simple stuff. In fact, the PEP itself, 333, you can read through it in probably 10 minutes. It's a very straightforward thing, and there's plenty of Medium articles that follow up on this and talk about other things. There's one last thing. We've been talking a lot about synchronous web servers. Right, we've been dealing with this concept of a request coming in and a response going back out, and it was all happening kind of synchronously. We were returning things. I'd encourage you to go and check out ASGI as well, because we're at a really interesting time right now. There are asynchronous Python frameworks out there, and there have been for a very long time, but they've all built things up in their own sort of way. And they don't have a standard protocol that they use yet. But there's some adoption, there's some documentation out there for a format called ASGI, or the Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface. And the idea here is that if you define something that did for asynchronous development what WSGI did for synchronous development, then you could definitely see a big spurt of innovation in Python asynchronous web servers as well. I'll be taking questions afterwards if you want to come and uh, speak with me in person. I won't take them up on stage. But thank you for coming out to this. Again, my name is Ryan Wilson Perkin. I'm a software engineer at Wave. We're hiring. Come talk to me. I hope you enjoyed this and enjoy your break. Thank you.